Well, Duke, where the hell are we going today? We're gonna go to Finchabaleo's record ranch. Oh, Lord, not that asshole again. Bless his heart. The same. Now get on your horse. Good morning, Michael. Hey, Kevin. I can't see you just yet. I can hear you, though. Oh, let's see. Maybe there's a video mute kind of thing. Uh, start video. There we go. Now you should see me. There you are. <laughs> All right. Morning, sir. How you doing? Good morning. Good to meet you, Michael. Yeah, nice to meet you. How's the weather out there in L.A.? Uh, hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be 104 today so uh, oh you got us you got us beat i think it was going to be 99 today not, okay that's a lot better that's, that's <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay but you, you can hear me okay the voice isn't crumbly yeah. or anything no okay. no i was doing some this is my first time really using zoom properly so oh okay checks we're we're talking about hi-fi audio but then we're dealing with a tin can on a cord. <laughs> yeah i know i know it's true Oh, well, let me, uh, let's see, make sure this is going. Can you hear me okay? Oh, you're fine. You're doing good. Okay. I was trying to see if I could do the split screen Woodstock thing that I see on Wood on uh, YouTube, but my picture's real small and that's fine for me. <laughs> I'll deal okay. with that. Well, it looks the opposite to me. You're you're real big and I'm real small. But... Yeah, okay. It's, it's just reverse. So whatever. Go uh, we'll get started and uh, for sure. everybody out there, there on uh, when this gets put on YouTube. Hey everybody, this is Pincha Belio. Welcome to Pincha Belio's Record Ranch. I'm Michael, and today we're going to be interviewing Kevin Gray. Hi, hey, Michael. Here. Good morning, sir. Good to meet I, you. Kevin, I swore I wasn't going to do this, but every because everybody shows their albums. <laughs> <Stuff you know. laughs> okay. So, and I didn't want to do it, but I could not stop myself. This is one of yours from the Wayback Machine. Jimmy Buffett's A1A. <laughs> okay. This must be a replacement lacquer from the early 80s. I was going to say that's probably when I was working at MCA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> shows, uh, what is it, TCS? KPG at TCS? Oh, that was a cutting system. That was, uh, that was my, my uh, side business. My, well, my primary business at the time when I went to work for MCA. Okay. Well, I have to, I have to compliment you on this because it sounds great, number one. Oh, well, and thank number you. two. Your story, I think you told Chad about this uh, a while back, and that been her long epic interview he did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, he was, uh, listen, you were talking about uh, your stint at MCA, and uh, what was it? It was uh, Steely Dan Asia. Steely Dan Asia. But anyway, I wanted to thank you for telling that story because as a teenager, I would go out and buy records, and ah, let's say something was on DECA or Dunhill or ABC. Mm -hmm. And then typical moody teenager, oh, this is stupid. I don't want this anymore. Throw it out, give it to somebody six months later. Oh, man, why not do that? So go back, buy it again, and it winds up being this guy, the MCA. Uh -huh. And I'm saying, well, well, it's a newer copy. It, it, it's probably a lot better. You drop the meal. Oh, no, what happened? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's uh, I was like, that's oh, I the bane what? of my existence. I'll tell you a funny story about that. That crappy tape that that was cut from for the replacement lacquer is the uh -huh. same one that they used all the songs from Asia on the Steely Dan Gold CD. So really? it, it, it's like this, this huge sound change when it goes from one song to another every time it goes to one of the songs from Asia. Uh -huh. Well, I was wondering about that because I, I, I was wondering if that has occurred with other uh, record labels because, again, going back to Artisan, you guys cut the... Uh, the self-titled Outlaws album with yeah, I cut Grass that I mm -hmm. forever with Paul Rothschild. I'm sorry, I talked to you. I'm sorry. No, I just said with Paul Rothschild, the producer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I had the original pressing of that had the artisan stamp, and then the copy I've got now is probably a early '80s pressing, and mm. no artisan stamp. You drop the needle down, and you go, oh, 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 what happened? Oh. <laughs> sorry to hear that. I love that record. That was. Uh, Oh, I figured it's a good one. But yeah. anyway, there was Jimmy Buffett, and then this, I picked this up about a week or so ago. Oh, okay. Rain. 
And my compliments to you on that. This I've had the original pressings of this, and this really does have more guts to it. Great, it's got, thank you. <laughs> guys are all standing around the turntable at work because I I'm, I'm a press a record press operator. Yeah, we're pressing records. We got music playing, and also we hear the the kick drums from the very end of "Let's Go Crazy." Okay, let's turn the speaker down a little bit. <laughs> so yeah. Um, first question I had for you is mostly just some technical terms. I mean, it's pretty much kind of common sense stuff. You can figure it out. But uh, just for clarification, things like safety copy or EQ or you know, EQ production copy, mm -hmm. what these entail specifically? Just to make sure I've got, I've got everything clarified. Well, a safety should be a flat transfer of the master tape. Okay. And then the EQ production copy would be the EQ copy that's run usually when the lacquers are cut. So it would match all the EQ levels everything that was done okay. when it was mastered so it's not done after the fact it's always no. done after. okay right okay. all right and there was another one cutting the safeties are usually run before i even see the tape you know they would make a safety of the master tape before the master tape gets sent out and i'm talking about um, on the originals not 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 reissues you know okay so let's say at at uh at artisan when uh, you were starting out you would work off of the master or safety copy uh, well, if it was for a new release, I was working off the master, but uh, you might be thinking, I, you know, I mentioned one of the reasons that I was able to get hired at Artisan at the point in time when I did is they had gotten the CBS recut account. Um, oh. And so I was, those were all from EQ copies, but, you know, I, my, my first job at Artisan was cutting replacement lacquers for Simon and Garfunkel and Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears and Santana. You know, I thought uh, I died and gone to heaven, you know. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, I just got Chicago's greatest hits uh, just this last weekend. That was a good one. <laughs> yeah, uh, love those guys. So you would work off of uh, the master. Mm -hmm. um, what about, this is a weird question. What about 45s? Would you, if you got an LP to cut, would they, would the record label also give you the, like if there's a hit single that they wanted to release too? Off the oh, you're album? talking about 45 seven inch? Yes. Just, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Would they, uh, would they have you guys do that too? Or would that be off the yeah. master? Well, yeah. Or? On, on most of the records that I mastered the album, I mastered the, the seven inch too. Sometimes there was a separate mix for it. Sometimes it was just cut off the LP. And okay. in rare cases, the edits were on the master tape for the LP and you had to pull the pieces out, cut the seven inch and then put the pieces back in. Oh, okay. I was <laughs> like, I was going to ask you about something like, what, what would you guys do if it was like Anagata de Vida? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think they put that, that, that out as a part one, part two, right? Wasn't that the way they did that? Um, I never cut that, but I have it. I have the two, album. Five. Uh, no, I think they just whacked it down to like, did they? 15 seconds or something it's <laughs> okay. basically <a> piece. <laughs> yeah okay um with uh mastering um uh, how has uh mastering equipment changed over the decades from when you started compared to what you have now well um the system that i'm using presently i built with a my business partner doug shepherd and um it's the same system as I had in 1979, but it's been upgraded, you know, electrically, you know, new capacitors, things like that, better, better capacitors. Um, but it's pretty much the same system because there's been very little development, if any, really in, in cutting heads, lathes, any of that stuff. Um, we designed a new disc computer for actually just spacing the grooves on the record. You know, it's not in the audio, it's, it's just machine control but we designed a new system to replace all of the uh, Zuma computers that had been used since the late seventies and early eighties. And were basically getting almost impossible to keep running. So, wow. but that that's probably been the biggest improvement really is, is the computers um, that are used to do the, the group spacing. A friend of mine, I told him that I was going to be doing an interview with you. So uh, he had some questions for uh, Paul down in Houston, Barack, P -Dub, my buddy. Uh, oh, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I've been meaning maybe at some point you could uh, privately send me his email because um, I had some comments that I wanted. I, I really appreciate his channel and his reviews. So. Oh, yeah. He's always oh, very good with that. 
uh, one question he had was, um, I thought I had everything planned out. Uh, it was in regards to a tube system that you were working on. Have you got <laughs> that completed or? Yeah, um, I need to do some explaining about that. Um, I built an all vacuum tube system for recording. So it goes from microphones all the way to the cutter head. And this was an idea that I came up with in 2005 to get that vintage sound that, you know, everybody seems to love on the old records with new artists. And so it's, it's a system that it's a complete system and it's only really for my label. So yes, I have a complete vacuum tube cutting package, um, which includes Macintosh uh, MI 350 power amplifiers and all the rest of it was built from scratch and designed by, from, by, by me. Um, but it's not really something that I'm offering to my mastering clients. It, it's for my label. Just something very exclusive. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and, and the, the same applies to my studio. I, uh, Fremer did an article uh, that was really nice on Analog Planet about my new studio that I built to, to do the recording for this project. Um, but it kind of made it sound like it was the studio that was open to the public. And it's, that's not what oh, it is at all. It's it's just for my label. So everybody, yeah, going down there. Oh, you think I can get out there? No, no, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, talking about tube and solid state and sure. what have you, uh, did an interview about a year ago, somewhere right around there, with uh, Michael Ludwig's and uh -huh. Danny. Is that Danny K. Danny K. Sonic Flare. Uh, he. Uh, you and Michael came up with a great term called the golden age of sound, <laughs> which you were ballparking somewhere right around 1955 to about 64. Right. And I've got plenty of things over here, mostly orchestral stuff uh, right. that certainly attest to that. Uh, but yeah, during that time period, that's the, when the beginning of Hi-Fi started and it was mm -hmm. like all the labels were competing with each other. Who had the exactly. best, artist, best sound? <laughs> but then you get to I'd say probably about the mid to late 60s to the early 70s, and the sound changes. Yes. All of a sudden, everything sounds muffled and a little muddy. And what, what happened there? Uh, that, that's a great question. And I can't answer that because I'm old enough to remember. I, you know, I, I didn't start mastering until 72, but mm -hmm. I became pretty darn interested in everything about recording in the late 60s. And so I was kind of there as that was happening. Um, the biggest change was things going multi-track, you know, up until 64, everything was, or 63, I guess, everything was three track or direct to stereo or direct to mono, you know, prior to 58. Okay. So yeah, there was just a whole lot less in the, in, in the process, in the signal chain, you know? Um, uh -huh. But then when, when things started going four track around 64, 65, um, there weren't enough tracks to really give everybody the creativity that they needed. So there was a lot of bouncing. Uh, you know, it wasn't uncommon to record four tracks and then, uh, or, or three tracks, you'd mix those three to one track and then erase the other three tracks. And then you'd have three more tracks to record, or there would go four track to four track, which involves another generation. So all of those things degraded the sound. Um, I, I wrote a paper about this things actually started to improve when we finally got 16 track in 1969 um, okay. because you didn't have to do all of that bouncing and, and uh, you know, combining of tracks and all of that stuff until you actually just mixed it down to stereo. Uh, okay. But then around 1973, you know, we went 24 track and then it all went to hell again because, you know, the track <laughs> No, seriously. I mean, the track width was narrow enough. You had to have Dolby on every channel, you know, and then they developed VCAs to put in the audio chain for uh, the consoles to allow you to, to mix it because, you know, you only had two hands or maybe four hands if you get another guy on the board and you got 24 tracks mm -hmm. to mix. So um, mm -hmm. it's just I, I think that it just kind of all really started to go to hell around 1974. OK, so that's but, that's but, but 60, you know, mid 50 to mid 60, 60s is is considered the golden age because pretty much everything was either done three track or direct to two track and uh, yeah. to me that was the best sounding of, of everything and, and, and really, the fact really. that it was all vacuum tube you know early solid state wasn't great <laughs> and when did solid state start being used as early as the mid 60s um sony came out with the c38 microphone 
which was the first FET, you know, transistor microphone. And then everybody followed very quickly. You know, Neumann came out with the U87 and uh, AKG, you know, came out with the 414. And, and then by that time, you know, everything, uh, mixing consoles started going solid state. Some of the really early mixing, solid state mixing consoles were horrible sounding. They had no headroom. Um, oh. <laughs> Oh boy. Well, that kind of leads me to another question is with the reel to reel tapes, you've got quarter inch, half inch, one inch, two inches, if I'm not mistaken. Were there it's two been inches? done. Yeah. Yeah. I think I saw that with a, a video on the making of uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. I think they said it was a, a two inch master or whatever. Oh, but that's the multi track. That's the multi track yeah. on that. That was okay. before they were doing really wide two track. Does the sound quality vary between the different widths of a tape? Well, are you talking about for two track or for multi track? Uh, two track and multi track, either either. Well, way. okay, yeah. I I just touched on the fact that when we went from sixteen to twenty four, that's all on two inch tape. So mm -hmm. obviously the track width got smaller when they went to twenty four, and that yeah. degraded things. It really did. Sixteen sounded better than twenty four, and most engineers today will tell you the same thing if they record to analog. Um, as a matter of fact, I've just done a couple of albums that were recorded 16 track and mixed down, you know, to two track stereo, just like it would have been done in 1969. And wow, the sound is amazing. So, <laughs> okay. yeah, there's a group called um, uh, Counting Cadence. Okay. It's out now and I mastered that and that was all done, you know, all analog. Okay. Well, this was actually goes to a question that, uh, that Paul had for you. Uh, Let's see where we go. It was uh, the most recent band that uh, you have mastered and uh, you really like. He was curious about uh, what that would be. When you say the most recent, you mean like a new artist? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Probably that record for Counting Cadence. I did that, uh, eh, it was over a year ago. But um, uh, oh, I, I just did, um, uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it, but I, I did, uh, you know, until it's released. But I did uh, Timothy V. Schmidt's new album, and uh, that's exceptionally good. Wow. That had every, anybody who's everybody is playing on this record because they all love Timothy, and uh, it's a great record. I was very impressed. Check that one out. <clears throat> with, uh, with that, is there a genre of music that you enjoy mastering the most? Is there one that's more? challenging than say another when it comes to um actually that's a that's a good question too you're asking a lot of good questions i appreciate this um the the stuff that i kind of cut my teeth on that was really challenging was we got the account for the ethnomusicology department at ucla which oh. was a nice way of saying world music but this <laughs> stuff this stuff was recorded usually direct to two track, like on Anagra or a Stellavox. And it's all kinds of wacky percussion and, and, you know, deep stringed instruments. And that stuff was really challenging to cut. It's um, a Frank Zappa album. <laughs> pardon me? It's a Frank Zappa album. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've cut some of Zappa stuff too. But, oh, yeah. um, but that, that's, you kind of asked a multiple uh, pointed question there so the other part is for, like favorite genres you know i'm kind of i'm kind of pegged as a jazz guy and i don't have a problem with that because i love jazz and it's some of my favorite stuff to cut but i also grew up in the mid 60s so i'm definitely a british invasion guy and so uh, although i've never gotten to do anything for the stones or the beatles which were my two favorite you know british invasion bands oh, yeah. i've done stuff for the who i've done stuff for the kinks you know i did a big bunch of box sets for the kinks uh, they did a, a an LP box set, a seven inch EP box set, and a seven inch forty five box set. So oh, that was that, that was a that was a thrill to work on because I love the Kinks. Is there any chance that uh, anybody's going to release Dave Clark Five anytime soon? Oh uh, boy, I'd, I'd be up for that. You know, I I believe he owns all of his masters. So I was wondering about that because he put out a double CD in the early nineties, and it's. It was almost like a one-man band. I mean, he assembled the tracks. He wrote the liner notes. Yeah. He he's a brilliant that. guy and a brilliant businessman. I mean, he's just done. You, you know about the fact that after the British invasion had happened, he went mm -hmm. and bought all of the uh, television shows of the six. You know, some of some of them I think from the BBC 
and all yeah. the other companies, Ready Steady Go, all this kind of stuff that Indeed. people were producing in England. He owns all that stuff. So he's made a fortune off the British oh, invasion wow. without even being an artist himself, you know? <laughs> well, that's actually pretty good because I've heard the BBC, at least back then, they weren't too keen on, uh, on saving some of their stuff. Exactly. So he said, yeah. I'll buy it. Terry Gilliam was like, well, well he, uh, was it, he went there. Uh, oh, we got some film reels. If you want them, you can take them. If you don't, we're just going to throw them away. Like, wait, this is all my artwork for Monty Python. Yeah, I'm gonna no. throw away. <laughs> when you mentioned Terry Gilliam, I was going to say I'm a Pyth big Python fan. So that's. Oh, oh, now that I would love to have those albums reissued. I'd love. Oh, that. yeah. Oh, you got to oh. cut those with the concentric grooves and all that kind of stuff. That would be. Oh, yeah. Like matching time. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I didn't even think about that. How did they even do that where they've got two sets of grooves on one side? Well, it has to be done fixed pitch. So the sides wind up being, or the various components of the side make, make the thing fairly short. But um, yeah, it's, I, I did one once and I don't ever want to have to do another one. It's, it's a oh. lot of work. Yeah. Okay, so you know, you have to more. manually set down the cutter head, you know, and get it just at the right place as it starts, the music starts. And yeah, it's, it's crazy. Oh. One question I had for you is I uh, I like a lot of recordings from the 30s and uh, the 40s. A lot of big band, Glenn Miller. I grew up with that stuff. My parents played oh. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. One of the, when I started rebuilding my record collection, one of the first things I had to get was the Carnegie Hall concert of Benny Goodman's. From the yeah, my wife and I were just talking about that. She had never heard about that. And I was telling oh, her yeah. the whole story about that. You know, the first jazz group to play Carnegie Hall. Oh, yeah, people were protesting it. Now, we don't want that street music in exactly. here. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But uh, a lot of... Sounds pretty mainstream today, doesn't it? <laughs> or, I mean, I, for that era. Pretty much. But um, a lot of those recordings... I, I Well, jumping ahead of myself here. I saw an educational film that was made, I guess, probably around the in the mid-40s or late-40s by RCA Victor explaining how records were made back when they were still doing the seven yeah i've got i've got that video that's great and there were, there's like, like this one wall like, i saw everything in gleaming metal they're showing the the uh, the metal masters and everything uh -huh. right if those are transferred today for a greatest hits collection of somebody how how would that be done today would do those still exist or they've been transferred to tape or well back in the late 80s i think it was they put out um rca you know which of course is now sony put out a glenn miller compilation where apparently everything was redubbed from the metal parts so really? some, somewhere they they still had the 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 you know the metal mothers for all that stuff wow and, okay yeah <laughs> i didn't know if those things had faded to dust or got tossed out or you would think so but i remember um when i worked at mca in the vault they had the metal parts for everything, you know, from from Bill, Billy Holiday, you know, you, you name it. Um, oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, with mastering, um, going back to some more mastering questions. Sure. Uh, there's another question from Paul or from Paul. Uh, okay. What do you tend to do more of these days? Reissues or new releases what what would be the, the ratio oh it's huge in the in the reissue direction um i do very very few new albums um i just did uh amy ray's new album from the indigo girls um okay. but i don't do a lot of um i don't do a lot of new stuff uh okay. i do well actually probably the most new stuff i do is the, the so-called frontline releases for uh, blue note because they, you know, Blue Note is an existing, you know, new new artist label too. You know, not just the old stuff, although that's what they're really known for. I think to most people, but um, they have new albums coming out. Bill Frizzell did a couple of albums for him. Did a couple albums for Charles Lloyd. Um, uh, uh, um, Julian Lodge. I can't even think of everybody, but yeah. So I, I do a lot of their frontline releases too. But you know, it's still it's still probably eighty percent or more <laughs> reissue work issues and yeah, most, mostly for blue note and for concord um yeah do you reissue anything outside of speaker's corner and uh, some of the mastering you did for the japanese blue notes do you do any other mastering for international labels or oh lots lots 
I'm doing stuff for a label in Korea called Beat Ball, B-E-A-T. Mm -hmm. um, do a, a lot of work for them. I do um, other European labels. Uh, there's a label called Omerta in the UK that I do stuff for. Um, I do stuff for um, Sam Records. Um, I think they're in France. And then um, what's the label in, in Italy? It's called, or Spain, Spain, I think it is called, um, I'm getting confused, confused now, but there's a label called The Lost Recordings, TLR, and I do a lot of their work, so. Okay. Um, again, with uh, tapes, since you do a lot of reissuing and uh, quite often you do get to work off of the masters, uh, are there masters to albums that uh, just can't be used anymore? What I was thinking of was kind yes. of like uh, with, with movies, you've got uh, some of the restoration guys talk about with certain film classics. They're loved and cherished so much and they are just worn out. Mm -hmm. can't think with, so they got to go with a backup copy or something. So, how long yeah, I, I tried to do a Johnny Cash project from the 50s. And the tape was completely shot. It was on Scotch 201. Um, and, it, you know, it's an early tape. 111 was the first and then 201 followed that up in about 64, 65, somewhere on there. And um, that has a problem that if it's not properly stored, the oxide literally starts coming off of it, you know, in chunks. <laughs> I mean, you, yeah, can, you, can, hold, you can hold the tape up to the light and see through it, you know. That okay, now that was good because that was something I was, I was, I was also going to ask you because there's an interview I saw with Frank Zappo in the early 80s, and this was just after he had fought like hell to get the rights and the masters to all of the uh, the early mothers of invention stuff. Oh, yeah, Earth. yeah, he's, he's got a huge, they have a huge, the, the estate has a huge vault of his stuff, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, I think it was, I think he was talking about Freak Out, the first one. He said that he held, just like you just said, he held the tape up to the light, he said he could see right through it. Yep. So that's got a 16-bit digital transfer. I think with newer vinyl presses, it's copied off the 16-bit. Uh -huh. So, yeah. <clears throat> so what the when you said oxidation, that's the the brown material on the on the tape, correct? Right, the part that goes against the heads. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oxide. It's called ox. It, it's actually literally iron oxide, ferric oxide. Has there Rust. ever? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> rust basically <laughs> has there uh, ever been an album that you've mastered when you were starting out at artisan uh -huh. and then oh man i did it yeah it sounds great i'm really proud. and then years later you go oh i wish i'd done a little more i want to <laughs> is there a well i have to say that hasn't happened too often but there have been a couple of times when you know you revisit it and go eh, i would have done that a little differently now in, in my defense, yeah, I've got to say also, you're also, when you're doing it originally, not a reissue, you're generally working with a producer. So some of the things you might be doing are things that he's asking you for, not what you think it needs. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a compromise, a, a little bit of a tug of war in, in some cases, you know, on the sound. You know, with that and reissues today, do you have something similar to that in, in terms of somebody kind of overseeing everything oh get, make put a little more bass in there oh make well when i when i do the tone poet series for blue note i'm working with joe harley and uh joe and i tend to hear things pretty similarly and we get along really well so you know we have a ball there's there's no tug of war there but occasionally he'll say yeah maybe try one more db of bass on this or you know maybe maybe add one more db, db of treble on this or mid you know whatever um so yeah so i, I have total input from him on, on that series. And yeah, like I say, we work really well together and it's, it's always fun. When I do the classics series for Blue Note, a uh, completely separate series, I'm working on those on my own. So it's, it's up to me. Just as far as, yeah, this needs to be punched EQ up. and level, yeah. You. Um, A mastering engineer that is still living that you respect the most. Oh, is there? I'd have to say Bernie Grunman. Um, Bernie. Bernie and I are friends. I don't really consider, although you know we do some things 
for the same clients, but you know, I don't find that there's any strong competition between us. Um, and, you know, and Chris Bellman who works there. Great. And, and we help each other out, you know, like if, if you run out of lacquers or whatever, you know, can I borrow a box of 25 lacquers? I mean, that's happened back and forth, um, both, both ways. Um, and, uh, if there's some problems happening with lacquers or styli or something, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a friendly competition if it's competition. Maybe I had a moment where he had to contact him and, okay, how did you do this 20 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, not usually. Not usually. The other guy who's now passed on was, was Doug Sachs. I was, I was a huge fan of the oh, stuff that he did at Mastering Lab, but he is not no longer with us. Yeah. I've got, I've got plenty of, he did all, he did a lot of the, uh, the John Williams scores. Oh yeah. Star Wars. Star Wars. And my, one of my favorites was Close Encounters because oh, yeah. that loud super loud yeah on that yeah. one although uh, actually surprisingly um they did um uh what was it et i think was actually mastered at, at mca whitney i think um, i think so I'm, well, i've got it buried over here i'm not gonna look for it right now but yeah i don't think i remember seeing tlm on there on the yeah, deadwag i don't recall yeah, seeing I it either um i was going to mention I got to collaborate with Doug when we did the 30th dark side of the moon, 30th anniversary. Oh. And that was a blast. That was the only time we'd ever actually worked together on a project. And that was really fun. And the other funny part of the story was we had two other mastering engineers come in who were, were mastering lab guys um, who well, actually ex mastering lab guys who just kind of came in to hang out. And so, you know, we made this joke, how many mastering engineers does it take to do Dark Side of the Moon? It was four. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad about that because I remember when that came out and I thought, oh, it's, it's probably the digital remix put on. But, but no, no, that was the first. next release after that. Oh, yeah. The okay. one that I did was from the original master tape. Oh, man, that's the one. I Yeah, because a long time ago, I used to have like five different pressings of that. Uh -huh. Friends come over here. Just pick one. What? What's wrong with you? Why do you have five? Well, this one's a little different. That one's got uh, more. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was processed at RTI and then pressed at Palace in Germany. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember you were talking about the difference between pressing it, doing a test press at RTI, compared to the release. Boy, you do follow me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I uh, yeah. I, I I thought the. R you know, I'll go on record. I thought the RTI test pressing sent it's the, R the RTI superior. Well, that's that's what's got me wondering as a press operator because we work off of uh, these are called Mural Tech Warm Tones that come out of Canada. So at some point, I'd like to see if is I that a copy of, of the SMT? I don't think so. It's it's okay. a very small compact. I was trying to see at some point if I can maybe take a road trip up to Chad's place. You uh -huh. are people only gotcha. six and a half hours of the road. But, uh, yeah, we've got all the SMTs, so I want to see how those work compared to what I'm used to. Okay, but, now uh, are the ones that you're using are they manual presses? They're or are all they automatic. Automatic. Oh, all sorry? automatic. All automatic. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, you got the there's the hopper, there's the extruder. That's on oh, yeah. one end. The press in the middle. Yeah, the I'm, I'm familiar thing. with presses in general, but yeah, I just I wasn't sure which which that was because yeah. you know like the fine builds and stuff like that. You know, a lot of people use those to press manually and then they make a big deal about it right. <laughs> yeah that's yeah, that's the stuff i would like to see just to see how they compare so mm -hmm. uh, well i know that um chad has to do a lot of his 200 gram pressings on that because uh an smt just won't quite handle 200 gram it'll do 180 just fine but 200's yeah. pushing it 200's on the on the fine build has you have to use the fine build yeah okay this there outside of um well, we were talking about RTI and, and Palace and everything. Has there ever been anything that you've mastered and sounds great, sounds impeccable, but then somewhere in plating or pressing, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it just sounds muddy or something's yeah. wrong? Yeah, change. it's happened. Um, not so much with the audiophile reissue work. That's been pretty good around the world. But I can remember back in the day in the 70s, <laughs> really going back here but um some of the pressing plants in the u.s started polishing the stampers to reduce noise and yeah. boy along with the along with the noise went the high frequencies 
And uh, <laughs> it was funny. I was doing a reissue of, um, of uh, um, Loggins and Messina sitting in their first, first mm-hmm. album. And uh, I didn't have an original of it. I have some of their later stuff. But I went to a record shop and bought one in really virtually mint condition. I mean, there wasn't a scratch on it to, to use as a reference, you know, just to see what they had done when they first cut it. I dropped it on the turntable and went, whoa, there was just no top end on it. And it was kind of like this. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was obviously in the uh, in the st- sanding the stampers era. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah we're grinding down the, the frequencies and everything on the. So I guess yeah. so. It's just it's just got to be a chemical reaction, I guess, to the nickel and the polish. Or well, polish. The, I mean, right. what I'm talking about, they were literally, yeah, polishing. I mean, they were taking material off of this. You know, you're oh, losing no. oh, the high. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're losing the high frequencies when they polish oh, it because yeah. what they're trying to get off is noise, and that's going to be much bigger stuff <laughs> than the, the high frequencies. You know. Yeah. So, you're going to lose the high frequencies to get that stuff off. Well, luckily where I work, we don't do that. So <laughs> I believe you. No, I don't, I don't know. I don't think too many people do it here anymore. Although I have heard that there are some plants in Europe doing it, but I'm sure they're doing it a lot really? less and a lot with a lot more finesse than it was happening here in the seventies. <laughs> um, regarding analog versus digital. I don't personally, I don't, I don't get into the argument of is this analog, is this digital. If it sounds good, it sounds good. That's that's my thing. Uh, but in regards to transferring an older master to a digital file, what, is this more of a, is it a convenience factor or is it a preservation act? Um, I can't speak for the labels, you know, because they're the ones that are generally doing that. Yeah before they send me either the original master tape or the digital transfer. Um, well, I know that they do digitally archive things at real high resolution, which is a great idea. And anytime mm-hmm. I get an analog tape from Warner or from Universal um, or from Concord, it is always digitally archived at wherever the tapes are stored before they send me the original master in case something should happen to it. Knock on wood. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, so yes, preservation is part of the thing. And the other thing, particularly with Sony on the East coast, you know, New York, they do not want to let any tapes out at all anymore. I mean, they want to do everything in house. I guess if they master it, they hand carry it to wherever they're going to master it. And when they cut the parts, they bring the tape back. So that's their choice. Uh, but you know, I understand the idea They're, they, these tapes are valuable and, you know, Every every time you run them, it's a little bit more wear and tear, you know. So, well, I was thinking about that, like with a lot of bands that now own the rights to their music. If they've got the masters too, then yeah, we want to release it on vinyl again. No, we just got the tapes after forty years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. <laughs> well, you probably know I've talked about this, but the problem, the big problem with tapes is all the stuff that was recorded in the mid '70s and the '80s on uh, originally uh, it would have been uh, ampex 406 and then later they came up with 456 and all of those tapes today have to be baked in order to play um literally in a convection oven um and it's just because the tape turns to sludge and uh, at first first it starts squealing and then it usually comes to a dead stop on the machine it's it's gummed up everything so much oh wow well you bake it and it's good for about uh maybe two three weeks and then it starts absorbing moisture again, and then it'll be sludging again. So it has to be baked every single time it's it's used, you know. Yeah. If there's wow. any gap in between one that's cut and, and then the next time it's cut. Yeah, with uh, digital recording, whether it's analog to digital or just straight digital, what are the improvements with digital recording that, have, that has happened over the decades? Oh, that's been huge. That's been huge. In, in my humble opinion, digital got released almost a decade too early. You know, if we had bypassed the whole 16 bit 44 one thing, we'd all be a lot happier. I think the the audiophile people, the people that really are listening to the music for the sound, not for the music, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, But the biggest improvement that happened, I think when we were still 16 bit 44 one 
in about 1990 or 91, uh, a company called Wadia, uh, uh, it's a uh, audiophile equipment manufacturer. They made a professional um, A to D converter that, to me, was a real ear opener. Suddenly, I liked the sound of digital, and I had never liked the sound of digital on the early CDs. And uh, even though I was already doing digital mastering, mm -hmm. but uh, when that came out, it was kind of a world changer for me. Then when you know we went to twenty four bit and and uh, 88k or higher 96 192 um you know digital is pretty good now it's it's pretty good do i like it as well as analog probably not but it's you know it's getting closer and closer and the the really really good converters are really really good and they do make a very uh you know good copy because when i listen to something that if I hear something on CD, then yeah, obviously it's really, to my ears, it's really shrill. It's too sharp, too antiseptic sounding. It's just, <laughs> ah, I can't stand it. But then if there's a digital recording on vinyl or if it's an analog that's been copied to digital, it's put on vinyl. Oh, okay, that's fine. I totally accept that. That sounds good. But uh, what what are the, uh, maybe just my hearing, my hearing is not that good. What What are some of the differences sonically between an analog recording and a digital recording? Well, that's a hard one to quantify because digital, every digital converter, every type of digital converter, you know, modeled by a manufacturer sounds mm -hmm. different from the next one. Uh, some of them just, just do a beautiful, beautiful job. And some of them, I mean, there's 24 bit converters out there that I've heard that don't sound very good. And then people go, well, it's 24 bit. It's like, well, yeah, the number of bits doesn't tell you about the analog part of the analog to digital, you know, you have to have really, really good analog electronics in it that are creating the digital, um, you know, the, the input to the digital conversion. Um, but, you know, it's funny, I've, I've heard converters that make things sound harder. I've heard converters that make things sound softer in terms of, you know, having less high end. Um, I've heard some that just add a little bit of edge and distortion. I've heard some that just sound a little mask. They're, they're just all different. So, you know, I, I use a Pacific Microsonics Model 2, which hasn't been built for years. It was like a $15,000 converter in 1990. You know, I mean, they were really expensive. Or not 90, the Model 2 didn't come out till probably about 95. But um, it, 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 it's still my favorite converter. I haven't heard one that I like better. Um, there's one made by a company called uh, Lavery that's quite good also. Um, but but there's there's some lousy sounding digital converters out there. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of hard to just, you know, say, well, this does this and this does that in terms of digital versus analog. Because, you know, when you talk about analog, which analog machine are you recording to? That makes a huge difference. Yeah. too. So, yeah. Because yeah, there's one it's uh, I have the original American pressing of my Goldfield's tubular bells. Oh, yeah. And Virgin, the, the record that launched Virgin Records. That's right. And this was done by George Piros at Atlanta. Oh, man. And one uh, of my favorite, another one of my favorite cutting engineers. Piro, he's, oh, he's, oh, he's prolific with Atlantic. <laughs> oh, but, absolutely. And before that, you know, he did all of the early, early stereo stuff for, um, for Mercury Command, uh, really? audio, the original Audio Fidelity. Oh, that was all done by George Piros at Fine Recording in New York. He worked for oh, Fine Recording. Okay. Yeah. Robert but Fine. He, he did the original. And then um, there's in 1981, there's a remastered version done on something called the Disc CBS Disc Computer. Oh, yeah. Ray, uh -huh. Ray Danos. And that thing, that's my favorite one. Oh, really? I don't know what they worked off of, but the bass is nice and deep. It's got this nice sparkle to it that's not in the original release and right well that actually sounds pretty good for early well music. yeah the disc computer thing was just just literally a disc computer i mean it was is to was to adjust the spacing of the grooves to get it uh you know maximum time and and level on the disc but oh. they were they were using a neumann uh disc cutting system which was probably superior to what it was originally cut on at Atlantic, it was a newer system. I mean, there were it's it's kind of funny. There were a lot of improvements in disc cutting system through like '66, through the mid '70s, and then there was another kind of improvement that happened that was going on right up until about 1980, 
And then it all went away because the CD was on the horizon. And I think Neumann built their last lathe in 82 or 83. And so there haven't been really any improvements since that, which is sad because there probably would be room for some. Now, that's an interesting point because uh, I everybody talks about the Beatles mono box. These uh -huh. days. And I'm an old stick in the mud. I like the U.S. pressings. I oh, yeah? Sorry, everybody. I like that. So, but if you get the original pressings, they're harsh, they're hollow. They, I pull the record out of sleep. I see that black capital label with the rainbow. Oh, no, no, no. But then newer, or not, well, newer pressings. Anything that was done in the 70s where they reissued on the Apple label or uh -huh. Capitol, the purple capital label, 80s capital pressings. The sound A lot of those were cut by my buddy Ken Perry at Capitol. Really? But they yeah. just keep getting Yeah, better. he did the White Album and he did Abbey Road for the U.S. Wow. But they just keep getting better and better sounding. So it was, was it just a change in the mastering engineer and how they treated it? Or was it like you mentioned? With equipment. I think it was mostly equipment. Equipment. Um, okay. Improvements. You know, the, the first, you know, I didn't like the, uh, I started buying import Beatle albums real early because um, I liked them better. Um, I never got into the whole mono thing back in the day. I was only buying stereos. Um, you know, I appreciate some of the mono mixes. And I know what went into, into Sgt. Pepper and all that good stuff. But uh, I, I tended to go to the stereos. And the interesting thing to me was in, uh, oh, what year would it have been? 74, 75, when the uh, 62 to 66 and 66 to 67 to 70, uh, the, the, the red and the blue albums came out. They were like a greatest hits compilation those were mastered by lee hulko at sterling in new york and yeah, i dropped those on my turntable and i felt like i was hearing the beatles for the first time that was that was an ear opener amazing yeah, I, absolutely I amazing. those that worked before <laughs> yeah everybody complains about the sound quality. i'm like it sounds perfectly good to me <laughs> yeah no, it, was, not, it sounded so much better than the early capital lps i thought oh for sure they, those things just that i guess that was i was trying to tie this in with uh talking about sound quality variances from the 60s uh, around that time period, 64 to about 69, capital, I don't care if it's mono or stereo or that duophonic thing they were doing, everything just got rough, just uh -huh. got really harsh sounding. But then all of a sudden, if you get later press, oh, it's okay again. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it's, some of that could be vinyl. Some of that could be, you know, I, yeah, there's, as you know, working at a pressing plant, there's a whole lot of variables after it leaves the mastering facility too. Oh, yeah. You know, so, yeah. Well, one thing I learned for sure early on was pressure, pressure on the, the actual press. Oh, sure, sure, sure. That will affect the sound quality for sure. Oh yeah, you, it, it, you get better high frequencies, you get better low level resolution. And of course mm -hmm. you don't get the non-fill problems that you tend to get. Yep, you know. yep. that's right. <laughs> well, I've been around this biz for a year or two. <laughs> that's why i was having fun asking you all these questions <laughs> oh it's great no I've, I've i've really enjoyed it with uh european releases or british releases how often especially during the british invasion as an example or even afterwards okay how often did we get a copy of the master and how you know how often we also got the original sent over here to save somebody like Sam Feldman at Bell Sound or Lee Holko at uh, Sterling. Yeah, I, I I can't I can't quantify that. Um, I know that they tended to ship them to New York more than they would ship them across the country to the United to to, to uh, California. So mm -hmm. we were working more with copies of European stuff um, back in the day. But I know that Lee Holko got like for instance, Cat Stevens. Uh, those were all cut from yes. the Masters for the world by Sterling in New York. You know, so that was an interesting choice. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to quantify that in terms of numbers, <laughs> percentages. I've always been, been curious because like I've got like, one of my favorite Moody Blues albums is In Search of the Lost Port. Oh, that yeah. Was Feldman. And that thing, it sounds to this day, it still sounds so fresh and so clean, just you know, like, okay, did they work off the tape or the master tape with that? Or did they get a copy or how? Yeah, they I, yeah I, I can't answer for that one. I don't know. But I know I not too long ago for Rhino, I did uh, two of the Yes albums and we had the original master tapes 
on both of those, you know, Eddie Offord's, you know, handwriting on the, on the box from Advision, you know, in England. Uh, I was surprised that those masters were over here. I would have assumed that they were copies, you know, because I know when, when I was in MCA and we were doing all the Elton John stuff, that was all copies. So, okay. you know, when, when they said in that expose article in the New York Times a few years ago that, you know, all of Elton John's masters were lost in the fire. It's like, no, they weren't. <laughs> those are just so copies for the U.S. More and more of that stuff now, too. Uh, yeah. The, um, yeah. Just I'm trying to think of something here. I had a question. I just completely went out of my mind. I'm sorry. That's, <laughs> no, that's all right. Not being very professional right now. No, um, no, you're, you're doing great. <laughs> I'm actually going to need to wrap this up here pretty soon. So I'm going to end this with another question from Paul. Oh, sure. Uh, if I got to, I got to talk to that guy. <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I can get in contact with him to later today and see if I can get his email. I'd really appreciate uh, that. That'd be great. Chat back and forth on Instagram. That's that's how we communicate. So uh-huh. um, I'm a big fan. What is it? It's um, where is it? I had to do quite a search to figure out what his name was. That was a, not oh, an yeah. easy one to find on the internet. <laughs> I didn't know until actually he sent me a Zoom request last year. We chit chatted for a little bit. So oh nice. Oh here it is. Uh, what is one question? that you wish people would ask you in terms of mastering? Oh, gosh. Um, What would you like to cut that you've never had a shot at? That would be the Beatles. (laughs) Beatles? Yeah. Oh, that would would be great. (laughs) Yep. Yep. And number two would be the Rolling Stones. So. (laughs) Now, have their masters ever come over here to the United States or... Their masters are here on several of the albums. I don't know what percentage. Probably not the you know the early early albums, but I know um, "Let It Bleed" was cut at Artisan uh, oh. originally, and um, what's his name uh, Andy Johns came in with that record. Yeah, it was mixed at Sunset Sound. So, oh. um, yeah, and so and so was uh, Exile on Main Street um and and that was also mastered at artisan and goat's head soup i mean there were i i can't even remember all of them most of the ones that were produced by jimmy miller with the exception of i, th- I think the first one was um uh, bigger's banquet that wasn't done at artisan but most of the other ones were and you guys also got to do all the black sabbaths the early oh yeah and i got to do a reissue of uh of um iron man what's that album called what's that Paranoid? Yeah, Paranoid. Yeah, yeah. Paranoid, yeah. I got to do a reissue on that from the original tape. Oh, but, now that's one I need to hear because there's a friend of mine at work. He's got, it's a new pressing. I think it's two LPs now. It's got a bunch of bonus stuff on there. But it was done by a mastering engineer at Abbey Road. Uh-huh. And here, you know, I, I work the late shift from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And it's just the two of us. We're busy pressing records and QCing and everything. And he's got the this abbey road edition playing and all of a sudden i'm halfway through walking across the floor to go do something i stop go, that doesn't sound right <laughs> what did they do what what yeah. just happened it went from sounding really good to sound like a bad cassette tape copy uh-huh. <laughs> so, so i need to see if i can find that find your cut of that but well it's not mine that was oh, oh mine yeah, yeah 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 i did that at acoustic no i was thinking the original was done at artisan but that was yeah. before my time yeah, I had the original of that. I oh. love the album on that. Yeah, yeah. Bob McLeod, as I've mentioned before, actually he's still living, but he's not active. Uh, he sold Artisan in like 1979 and mm-hmm. got out of the business. Um, so it, it blows my mind when I stop and think that I've actually probably cut a whole hell of a lot more records than he ever did. But he was my mentor. I learned everything I know about mastering from him. And he's still one of my favorite mastering engineers if you want to just talk about mastering engineers. so. Yeah. Yeah, and Lee Helco, of course, you know, he sold Sterling early on, too, and, and got out of the biz. So When did you do that? Pardon me? When, when did you do that? Um, I want to say in the 80s, mid-80s, maybe. Um, could have been as late as 1990, but I, I don't think so. Um, yeah, it's funny because Artisan 
And Artisan moved to Hollywood about the same time that Sterling opened in New York. And they were sort of friendly competitors, you know. Um, but Lee and Bob knew each other pretty well. And Lee at one time wanted to buy Artisan from Bob yeah. and sort of make it the Sterling West. I think they were actually going to call it Artisan slash Sterling West. <laughs> Sterling way out West. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but it never happened. Bob, Bob decided not to sell. Do you remember the first thing you ever cut? at uh, Bob's place? Well, um, in terms of the first session uh, that I ever worked on, it was Europe 72 by the Grateful Dead. And oh. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. that was <laughs> that was a thrill. Most of the band came in for it, which was surprising. Um, I never I don't think I ever met Bill Kreutzmann, but I met all the rest of them. And uh, not on that record necessarily. I don't, you know, the, the engineers were the main people that we were dealing with on that record, which um, were Betty Cantor and Bill Wolf. And, um, and that was, so that was cool. Um, and then I worked on several other dead projects, including solo albums and special projects like Old Lynn in the Way and Dig a Rhythm Band and, you know, some of that stuff. So, um, have fond memories of working with the dead. That was an interesting experience. Did they ever have any comments as far as sound? Any oh, absolutely. Um, at the time, you know, in the earlier stuff, I think it, it seemed to be, um, um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> Got a mental block. Not not Garcia, but. Uh, um, Bob Weir? Yeah, Bob Weir. Yeah, Bob, Bob probably had a little more creative input than most of the other parts, guys in the band. Uh, but then, you know, when I worked with Digger Rhythm Band, that was Mickey Hart's project. So I worked with Mickey on that and uh yeah bear you know mr owsley oh, stanley he yep. was the engineer for steal your face which i did another live album and then also um he did old in in the way the the bluegrass thing that that uh, jerry did i didn't hear that oh that's a magnificent recording and it was some of the best you know bluegrass players you know just um amazing people i didn't hear that playing with jerry oh. And if you've never heard Digger Rhythm Band, that's a real hi-fi record, too. It's a bunch of Indian drummers and Mickey and Jerry playing guitar. And um, pretty, pretty cool record. I always liked that record. What year did that one come out? Digger Rhythm? Well, that was probably 74, 75. It was right after Mickey came back. You know, he was kind of out for a while, and then he came back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Kevin, I don't want to keep you any longer. I've got, uh, you know... Thank you enough for this interview. and <laughs> Happy to do it. Great to meet you, Michael. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, Always happy to do another one down the road. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> All right, thanks, sir. All right, take care. <laughs>